Hey everybody, welcome to the After Action Report, a podcast from the Eden Project. I'm one of your hosts here all the time and happy to be here. I'm Michael Stewart. This guy across from me is my friend, my co-host, and the executive director of the Eden Project, Bryn Briggs. <laughs> everybody goes crazy. Hey everybody. So uh, are you having a good week so far? Um, today's Tuesday. It's fantastic. And in the podcast world, people are like, oh, it's no Tuesday. But, you know, we always like to yes. kind of update and see where we were yeah. from our last it is episode. Tuesday for some people. Somewhere yeah. it will be That's Tuesday, right? right? <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. So, Bryn, a couple of the things, uh, if, if people have not caught up yet on some yeah. past episodes or they want to know what the Eden Project is all about, let's share with them real quick. You can call, text. I often say prank phone call because, you know, hey, smoke signal, anything. Yeah. 678-632-5383. That number again, 678-632-5383. Or visit the website, eden-project.com. That's yep. eden, E-D-E-N, dash project.com. Depending on when they're, they're hearing this episode, mm-hmm. we're going through a, a rebranding and we're changing some stuff. So what they see this week mm-hmm. may not be the same as what they see well, next week. Well, that's right. Okay. New, new website, Super new Super excited about yeah. the new look and, and, and what's coming new on. New logos, new all logos, of that fun yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, and if you are listening to this at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe mm. hold your phone calls off until uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, sign up or something I found like out that. yesterday that if they, that they want to send me pictures um, don't send pictures to that to that number because uh, they don't come through. Oh, okay. Well, that's good, <laughs> especially depending on the pictures you're going to send. Right, right. <laughs> so the Eden Project is a veterans and active military's resource for mental health, helping those of them who need healthy mental health tools and resources to deal with day-to-day life. So if this is your first time joining us, thank you so much for uh, including us in your podcast world, and we hope that you will uh, appreciate what you've heard. Go back, check out some past episodes with some other guests. We've yeah. had some where just you and I are rambling, rambling guys and realize that we're here to provide the tools to deal with reality, unlike a lot of other people yep. and, and functions where they kind of just kind of doctor it up a little bit day to day. Yeah, that's what I think sets the Eden Project apart from, from some of the other groups is they provide an escape, and we all need an escape every now and then. Going fishing, going to the movie, reading a book, great escapes. But at some point, you have to come back and deal with reality, and that's where the Eden Project comes in. Exactly. So uh, some of the things we're going to be talking about in just a minute, um, but I think you mentioned right before we went on the air here, <gasps> you were going to go off script. And I'm like, oh, well, Uh-oh. what else is new? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we work on these scripts. And I'm going to go off script. What is it that you wanted to share this morning? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> It's so off script, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even remember. It was how far off script was I going to be? Because I do that all the time. Let me share it because I I I took notes. I got myself confused. (laughs) We had a lot of uh, notes uh, from our past episode, especially uh, the one that we did a couple of weeks ago, where we were talking with friends, the career captain's course, things like that. Were you going to share anything with that at first? Was I really talking about that today? Remember when I talked about why I'm not allowed to cook? Yeah, and that kind of blew my mind, you know. And then this, then and that's. But by, by the way, we can we can tease that for a future episode. Right, People right. People who have had um, active military, yeah. uh, whether it's PTSD, some injuries, things like yeah. that, and then there's certain things that you may should or should not do. And one of the things I found out this morning was that Bryn's <laughs> quote, and I'm doing the air quotes. If you yeah. Know, yes, yeah. he's not allowed to cook at home. Do we have time for me to hear that story? Because I need to know <laughs> why you're not allowed to cook. Story, yeah. So um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Because unless, you're a bad unless cook? Unless you own my house. No. <laughs> um, three different times I've, I've almost burnt my, burnt my kitchen down because oh. I'll get started. And it's like the, you know, Dory from, from yes, the Disney movies. Yes, yes. I I'll suffer get started as well. on something and get sidetracked and forget. And cooking is one of those things that three different times I've been distracted. It's amazing. And the kitchen, you know, ding near burnt down. So I spent Mm. 12 weeks in a hospital for my, my brain injury. And Mm. one of the things that they said was, yeah, stay away from the kitchen. You can make peanut huh. butter sandwiches. Crudite but is, <laughs> is your answer, sir. <laughs> but stay away yeah. from the kitchen. Things like the microwave are okay because it turns itself off. Yeah, the, the toaster, toaster pops itself up, but the stove just keeps stay on away. burning. Yep, so. yep. We need to create a veteran's stove that turns off after. What a cool idea. 
five minutes if you don't okay, turn everyone, it off. Everyone listening, that's our idea. Not <laughs> that's right. And in fact, so I want to go right into this now because you're probably, if, you're, if you've are if you been with us before, you're hearing a female voice Ooh, yeah. for the first time. You're that like, is me, who is the that female lovely voice. voice that I'm hearing right now? <laughs> well, let me introduce our guest who's going to be with us today, Juliet Fund. Featured in top media outlets such as Forbes, CNBC, Fast Company, and NPR, Juliet is a globally renowned keynote speaker, tough love advisor to the Fortune 500 and uh, CEO of the efficiency training firm, Juliet Funt Group. And it's good that it's her name and not somebody That's right. else. I never forget. She's, uh, she's an advocate for freeing the potential of companies of unburdening their talents from busy work. And she's brought her powerful, con- her powerful concepts to Spotify, National Geographic, Anthem, Vans, Abbott, Cos- uh, Costco, Hey, go Costco. I know a lot of military people. I'm sitting here thinking, is he going to read the whole client scroll? He's going to do it. Go ahead. Read every client. Wells Fargo, (laughs) Sephora, Cisco, ESPN. You put every client on there, right? wing and right wing companies. This is all good. I love this. Because what she does fits everybody. So ladies and gentlemen, Juliet Fun. Oh, yeah. I got the yay thing. That's great. Nice to be here. Thank you so so much. I am so glad that you were here. Um, Now, can can I talk? We didn't talk about this off air, but I'm going to because as a young child i remember in early preschool days one of the things that they would put on during tv time was one of my favorite programs and mm. i just we don't we won't have to stay on this long going. but i uh, think i can uh, figure yeah. it out so it was a very very uh, i i want to say it was groundbreaking when it came out yeah, and it especially the early days of television and we're talking 60s by the way and i think maybe even in the 50s because that was before 50s I was, was candid microphone now oh, that we're going to tease the name before there was television and then it was a radio program ladies and gentlemen it was candid camera and everybody remembers the wonderful host well, everybody Alan over Funk. 50 well, yeah. <laughs> well, you, know, you know there's things that make, I mean, make a comeback but I'm Alan telling you your... audience is going foggier and foggier at that reference well, as we go no, along sorry no I think oh. but everything comes back around there you'd be surprised the young people that That's remember true. Candid Camera that's true Alan Font was your father correct? he was yes he was oh. so I loved Alan because uh, as I grew older I realized that he really much like people like Art Linkletter and those people back in the day, really focused on young people. Mm -hmm. And he was so good with young people and bringing them onto the screen. And and the way he talked to them and dealt with them was just amazing at that time. You know, everybody was like, oh, children should be seen and not heard, that kind of thing. He was not that way if I'm... So he had a very famous story about that. By the way, your listeners should Google Guardian Angel Candid Camera, which was his favorite kid episode, The Guardian Angel. We're all writing it down, right? Guardian Mm -hmm. Angel. As if it's not (laughs) recorded. And so just listen to it again. He had a very uh, special way of connecting with those kids because he would walk into a preschool or a little school and they would rifle, they would shuffle the kids in to meet this guy, but he had to make intimate connection with them really, really quickly so that they would open up to him. So he would light a match and then he would feign having trouble blowing it out and he would go. And then he would turn to the kid and say, can you help me? And then the kid would do something that he could not. And he would kind of reverse that power distance between the two of them and then they could talk and then they could open up and something had been exchanged and so that was his little routine of how to get to a quiet kid i love that yeah that's what i read and remember i said well i read this thing but i couldn't remember the concept that's what the concept was there you go that is so powerful that's really cool yeah he had a lot of those little tricks you do it at home too no no we were already intimate (laughs) 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 no but he did, he did catch us a couple times. I guess the crew was bored and we were visiting from school and there's a couple of moments I went, all right, just film Julie, what the heck, you know? Oh. So they, that happened. Do you, uh, do you appreciate Juliet or Julie? I like Juliet now. I was Julie when I was a kid. I answered to both. Okay. Well, you said it, so I want to make sure I'm calling you the right, right thing. Yeah, Juliet. Juliet. I love Juliet that. Likes it sounds better. Oh, it's, it's, it's you know, a lot of it's names been me as for we a get long older, there's, there's appreciative. There was also a song by the Bee Gees, you know, my favorite group, uh, Juliet. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you should look it up and listen uh, to it. Maybe I, yeah, it I'd probably know it if I heard it. <laughs> so, um, so Juliet is here, and we're going to talk about several things. Uh, first of all, we're going to touch on the many things that she has done to, to get herself to be where she is today. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to tie it into how this... Uh, plays in with the Eden Project and the veterans and even active military and how you can apply a lot of this into your own life. And uh, and yeah. I can't wait to uh, share with that. So, Bryn, do you uh, you want to start off? Yeah. So what you left out in that super long intro and all the companies <laughs> that she's worked with, um, she's also published in Forbes, 
the Harvard Business Review, Psychology Today. And when I was going over the notes and I was looking at some previous podcasts and reading everything I could find about you to get ready for today, I got more and more intimidated. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I remember meeting you a couple of years ago at the Real People Gala. Yeah. And what I what I really enjoyed, and I, and I talked to your um, your assistant about this, just how incredibly, th- th- this will sound weird, how incredibly human and kind and nice Aww. and down to earth. I'm like, man, she's a real person. And, and not that you're not, but as I read through this, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I got more and more intimidated. All right, but let me tell you a real story about this. So, because <laughs> I do the same thing when I read these people who, you know, it's read a bio with all these awards and they've done so many things and everything on that bio is real, but you can also parse things out. Some reporter calls you and says, I'm doing an online piece for Forbes and can I interview you? And you do it and it goes up. And then for the rest of your career, you get to say Forbes. It's huge. And it's just some dude who wrote one thing online or, you know, a lot of these people pieces, I think it'd be so fascinating to get a bunch of big shot people together and have them reveal all the not big shot realities of their life and where they struggle and where cash flow sucks and where just all the things that nobody talks about. I think it'd be a much more even playing field than if we just all paid attention to our bios. Well, I'm going to live in that fantasy world where you're this awesome superstar. Okay, stay there then. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> Michael has acted with A-listers and, and he's been on screen with, with some, some big name artists. We had um, Mac on here. Mm-hmm. And here's, here's me. You know, um, speak, getting to speak to you guys. Aww. So it's, it's, it's really, it, honestly, it's an honor to have you on the show. Well, I'm proud. I'm proud of what we've done, but I think there's a huge amount of posing in the business community. At least I don't know as much about the military community, but you know, just when you meet the people behind the bios, you'll see that a lot of them are just regular people uh, and very flawed and uh, oh, very, yeah, with right. all their own sets of well, problems. And and as I try to remind Brent that you know, dude, you've you've served the military. You've been in foreign countries. You've you've mm-hmm. you've met quite a few. Uh, people, you know, big name people. So, I mean, hey, is it me acting with Robert De Niro versus you because saving you did, you lives know. and things like that, you know? Wow. So Now I want to interview I mean, you. You're, you're an important dude in my world. Well, I appreciate that. Well, let's um, let's get into the important dudette. That's speaking me. Of, That'll work. Speaking yeah. of Juliet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so let's start off, you know, kind of lay the groundwork and, and in case there's people who don't know you or haven't looked it up or read about you. Start with a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. Well, where to begin? So we have worked for 25 years this year in the world of corporate America, defeating the monster of busyness in people's lives, helping them figure out how to tame all of the garbage and the emails and meetings and decks and reports and late nights and second shifts with the laptop after the kids go to bed and all the things that make business and work really miserable for people. I did the first half of that time as a keynoter and consultant and coach. And then we started the company about 12 years ago. And what's really fascinating is how little the problem has changed in 25 years. And I think that there was this post COVID window where we were all kind of looking at each other going, Oh my gosh, this is it. This is the redesign opportunity. Business is a blank slate. Bosses have had their backs up against the wall because people are resigning. And this is the moment that work is going to get more sane and humane for people. And then it just didn't somehow. Like, it just didn't. Yeah. And in fact, I would arguably say it's gotten worse in the last two years. Pre-recession uh, budget freezes, less spending on people. Yeah, we got mental health in the byline, but I know, you know, there's, we're bringing in the therapists, but it's way, way down at the end of the line instead of going upstream to what's making people miserable. And we're, we're technically a high performance firm. So our job is to make teams perform better, but there's a humanistic kind of well being benefit, I would say to the work that we do. And it's, it's just really sad to see, I mean, I don't want to start on a pessimistic note, but I don't think it's a great time for people right now in corporate jobs. And right. now that I've been working in the military for about a year, I see all the same parallels and for very different reasons and for very different missions and with a lot more validity, I think, on the military side, because you never know when a piece of detail is going to be life saving detail. So right. it's harder to parse between what's important and what's not. But it's uh, I'm a worried I'm a worried person right now. In fact, we were trying to commission a study. We just started talking about this three weeks ago, so I don't know where it would happen. But I'd like to find out if spending on people has gone steadily down in the last ten years. I think that spending on a lot of other things has gone up. Mm-hmm. But I would love to see ten years ago, five years ago, now, what do we spend on helping human beings? Yeah 
be be better and feel better at work. And I feel like people right now listening are probably going, oh, that's easy. I, I, I feel like if you're looking at not necessarily, well, corporate, government, whatever, we're spending less on people. We put a lot of Band-Aids on things versus what's the source? How do we stop the bleeding? Or, you know, take, for example, mental health, which is one of the big things that the Eden Project yeah, yeah. Uh, is focused on with helping mm. people. You know, we can give medicines where, you know, pharmaceutical companies are making money and doctors are making money. We can do all this. But where do we get to the source? What maybe what's causing that? How do we keep that down without just medication? Yeah. I mean, that's just one of many, many, many things that uh, I think we could focus on as far as helping people. But it's it's this upstream downstream question that we are talking about, which is. There was an article in Atlanta Business Chronicle a little while ago. I won't date it because we're going to be dated, but <laughs> on um, employee well-being and all these programs coming in for mental health and therapy. There was another program on psilocybin and um, psycho- psychedelic alternative therapies. And But it's all, and, and the puppy parties and the perks and the oh, yoga right, class, it's right. all way down after people are so fried that they crawl to the door of HR and say, I need a therapist. Mm -hmm. What about going two years back in their predictable, miserable, cyclical, stressful life and changing the way that work plays out? We do not want to do that work yet. Mm -hmm. And we do not want to invest in that. What's been amazing about the military is they do. And I think the reason I'm having such a high ride in this nine months so far, almost a year, is they have a completely different mindset and they are ready and they want it and they see it. The, one of the big differences, and I, and I think you're, you're, that's what you're mentioning now, it's um, do we prevent the problem or do we yes, fix it yes, later? Yes, yes, Preventing it is always better mm, than mm-hmm. to try and go back later and fix it because it takes so much more afterwards to try and fix something than it does to prevent it. But so many people are afraid, well, I don't see anything going on, so there's nothing going on. Therefore, let's spend our money, our time, our resources on something else. Well, I also have another bias, which is this analogy we use of the car and the road. So the car, imagine the person is a car. You um, polish the tires, you get them high octane, you soup up the tires, all the things that you need to do. And that person is now ready. And that's the human being at work. But if you set them out on a road that's covered in potholes and detours, They can't really accelerate the way that they want to. And the the road is the organization. So what are the organizational norms and beliefs and leadership modeling and all the things that add up to the way work plays out? The the additional sad little twist on that metaphor is not only is the car ineffective without the road, but the car is then at fault. And the person's always, oh, maybe I need more uh, exercise. Maybe I should meditate more. Maybe I'm not getting enough sleep. It's all the person's fault that they are stressed and burnt out and right. exhausted because we keep putting the focus on fixing them as opposed to fixing the way work is. And then you drive that, that car down that broken road mm-hmm. and now the car becomes broken. Yep. I love that analogy. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And I think that you find like, uh, let's go back to the COVID years uh, when, when the government shut everything down and made you stay home and all that junk. Mm. Look what that did to people. I think right. that was a kickoff and we're finding that out in, you know, three, four, terrible, five years. Terrible. And we'll see we're trying years. to clean that we're mess gonna, up now. Yeah, we're going to see how horrible that was for humans itself, but also the workplace and things. Children but I also think, the, that, oh, I think yeah. that it showed that a lot of uh, businesses realized, hey, wait a minute. We can let some people work from home, help out with a little bit of their tension or that 40 hour got to be at the work, you know, stay home and work from home. I think we did kind of come across as seeing we can change the, our uh, structure of our businesses. A lot of businesses do. So you have so many concepts. And I think I think what we're talking about now is part of it. But there's so many concepts in your um, your book, A Minute to Think, is is what you're, you're what you're talking about is is in that book. The book is really a handbook of fixing what we're describing. How do you, what is a blueprint, a manual where you can tactically and easily go from step A A to step Z and begin to address some of these problems in teams and in organizations and now gratefully beginning to be in the military. I, um, so I read this when I first met you, I Mm -hmm. thought, okay, I had to remember. And that's one of the few things that I could actually remember Mm -hmm. was the name of the book. (laughs) So I remembered the book. I bought it, um, a a year or so ago. I kind of reread it, uh, yesterday and I'm thinking, man, this is just really really cool mm. powerful stuff thank you could you do like a high overview of the book or some of the maybe sure. your favorite concepts or something in there 
Sure. The, meta, the foundational metaphor of the book is that of building a fire, that if you're going to build a fire, you can have all the right ingredients, you can have perfect wood and dry pine needles and all the stuff you need. But if you forget one foundational ingredient, your fire will never, ever ignite. And that ingredient is space in between the things that you want to ignite. And that oxygenation of the spark is what human beings are missing. So they come to work every day to give their best. They have their little spark of their talents and their contribution. And then it's rapidly extinguished by everything we just talked about, wow. by an inundation of busyness and nonsense and poor culture. And so the book is a handbook of how do you understand the things that are attacking you? Um, how do you use techniques to reverse your thinking? How do you develop what we call a reductive mindset? Because the world is always going to be additive, 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 and you need to learn to strip away. And then just a whole bunch of tactical stuff on emails, meetings, communication, life at home, digital devices, phones, time with your kids. So the book basically parallels the initial work. And then what's been interesting, it's been three years since the book. So we have lots of new content that's gone deeper in different directions since then, and now all this new military perspective that um, is fascinating. So you'll be writing a new book soon. Ooh. Uh, maybe. I might may wait till the part kids two. are in college. Yeah. Or Jesse, <laughs> part two. Or minute, for, minute to Think for Military Teams might be interesting. So when you talk about that space, does it kind of lead into what I was looking at, the, the white space? Yes, and, we call it that? white space. The reason we call it white, just to be very clear, is in the coaching days when I would have an overloaded, busy executive we would open up their planner, which was at the time paper. And the only thing that was so important is show me the white. Where is the white unscheduled open thinking time, organizational time, strategic time. And that white space we define as time without assignment. Now, what's really interesting is in corp. I know I keep going back and forth, but I'm in this no, fascinating okay. phase right now. In corporate, it's very hard argument to find white space. We yeah. really don't go in through that door. We go in through high performance and team agility and effectiveness. But in the military, they've been really, really wanting it. They really, really get it because they're so afraid that strategy is atrophying in the face of all of this activity and emails and, and busyness. So that is the mission, but we Trojan horse that into the work. Our work on the surface is to help teams cut waste that keeps them from being more effective. And then the beautiful thing is you can Trojan horse in all the teachings you care about, about people and well-being and space and space isn't even a well-being tool. In the book, there's four different ways that you use this kind of margin, and only one of the four is recuperative. There's strategic thinking, there's uh, pondering and constructing new ideas, questioning ass assumptions, being constructive with your thinking time. There's lots and lots in that time that is not just a break, but it's just the openness and unscheduledness of it that leads your mind into creative and innovative places. So I'm so busy listening to her. I'm thinking, what am I supposed to be following us up with? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he's like, how do I fix myself? And, with then, it's, cool and then it's stuff, your but turn. I also have to ask yes. That question. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, we talk, you know, in, in the Eden Project, we um, we focus on gratitude. We focus on meditation, mm. but this is completely different. Oh yes, let's talk about that. So we actually have a little piece. I can't remember if we still have that, but meditation versus mindfulness versus white space. Yeah. So the difference is that meditation and mindfulness have instruction, at least in the early stages where you're following a candle, a mantra, a breath, a pre-recorded guided meditation. And you're supposed to kind of sort of be doing something. You focus on the thing and then your mind wanders off a million times as it naturally does. And then you return to the thing, the candle mantra breath meditation, yeah. right? That is, um, has a constraint in the sense is you're supposed to keep coming back. But in white space, you're like a dog running through the park without a leash. You are free. You're thinking about anything you want. You're not trying to return to candle mantra breath. You're just free. And sometimes that will lead you and to negative. Okay, right? And it's supposed to be that way. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes it will lead to negative thinking and you have to have tools around that. But sometimes it will lead to dreaming, planning, crazy kooky ideas that you haven't had yet that are innovative for your business because you're too busy. The idea of the freedom is the difference between white space and meditation or mindfulness. Now, mind wandering is the third category that people sometimes confuse. And the only difference between mind wandering and white space is that one is volitional. I'm going to take some white space. I'm freeing my mind. Okay. Mind wandering is accidental. It's you're working on a really important report and all of a sudden you're pricing an eBay 
on you're on eBay pricing a juicer and That's you have no idea how you got times, there, right? You're laughing at on YouTube going down a rabbit hole. Yeah. yeah. And you don't remember the transition or how you got there and you didn't choose it. That's gotcha. really the difference. So I think and, and I'm 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 gonna say this truly as a question, not, mm-hmm. not, not to try to be funny or sarcastic, because that's usually my style. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, reading this, listening to you, uh, watching your other podcast, mm-hmm. I think when I'm in the shower, I'm, I'm, I'm using white space because yeah. I'm doing nothing except letting the water hit yeah. me. I'm not focused on the things I have to do. Yeah. I'm just enjoying the moment, letting my mind. Is that kind of the, the white space concept? Yeah. To, to be in white space, I love being in white space in nature. I love being in white space on a walk with no technology. I love being in white space in front of a fire. Um, shower is great as long as you're, once, you, once you're done with your shower to-do list, right. That's white space. And don't forget to it's, clean the. Uh, it's you know, that moment parts. when you're. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. what I'm supposed to be in there right. for. There's a reason you forgot <laughs> that too, right? <laughs> right? But there's also, but this is actually, I mean, to get really nuanced about this, we live in a in a, a, a world where, for all of us, me me included, you get swept into doing a sequential list of things. So I get in the shower, I wash, I could do my hair and I get out of the shower and I dry and I put makeup on, I go to work and there's every second there's the next thing. The white space is when you stand in the shower after things you have to do and you just, oh, the steam and the heat and the privacy. And that is a method and that's probably more recuperative but you also might take 15 minutes of white space here at, at our wonderful co-working place here at Rome at Trillith, and you might just go sit out on that little brick patio in oh, the sun nice. yeah. and yeah. just whew, for 15 minutes. And what I believe is that a lot of the things that we're trying to um, create are just standing outside a locked door waiting for us to become less busy. Just, I'm here, I'm a great idea for your business, your nonprofit, your life, your family, but I can't get in there. I mean, it's busy every second, so I'll just wait. And then you open the door by a little nothingness and they just come in. So I was conditioned to believe, and, and I'm, I'm gonna take a wild guess, a lot of people you work with are, were conditioned the same way. I was conditioned to believe that every minute had to be filled up. And if it mm, wasn't filled up, yeah, it, you're lazy, you're, in, you're unproductive, you're not doing things But it is filled. But it is filled. If you had an MRI scan of your brain during white space, it's going blah, 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 blah with yeah, all yeah. this color. Stops, it's yeah. not empty, it's unscheduled. So yeah. let's just slow down for that. Time without an assignment means I get to improvise through the utility of this time. It doesn't mean that I'm wasting time. It means that I get to be fresh and spontaneous in where this time takes me. But that's the, that's the biggest misconception. We interviewed one guy for the book named Pete. He was a fascinating guy. He was an EMT who had taught other EMTs stress, what they call stress inoculation, getting them in these more and more dangerous scenarios so that they'd be ready emotionally for the real thing. And he had a day job. And in that day job, he became so stressed that he had to go to the ER with trouble breathing from the stress. He said, when I see five minutes open on my calendar, I feel an overwhelming pull to fill it. Absolutely. And that I think is what what you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I, I, I used the word condition on purpose. Yeah. Early, early on in my, in my life, in the military, ah. we were always, we, if, if we weren't cleaning weapons, we were running. If we weren't running, we were mm. studying. If we weren't studying, we were doing something else. Mm. They, they really try to keep every minute as full as possible. I'm glad to hear you're saying that things are changing now. Talk I don't think they... W- about, uh, you said you're working with the military, and I won't mention which f- branch it is because they're all... Because it doesn't matter. It, it's for all of them. Yeah, right. because the one branch isn't as good as the other branches. <laughs> I'm learning this. It's a very competitive <laughs> alpha male pissing contest. Am yeah. I allowed to say that on this okay. podcast? But um, <laughs> beep, beep, yeah. The, the military, which we will keep very generic, found out about me because I was on another podcast called From the Green Notebook, which is hosted by an amazing man named Joe Byerly. Fantastic podcast. And a very high up person in the military rated my book number one on a list of 70 books that they had read that that year. And that was how Mm. I began to have a presence. I will tell you, I come from no military background or family. This was as fresh as it could possibly be for me. I've had more fun in the last nine months. They are the most gracious absolutely heroic people that I've met in a really long time. And I can't wait to be with them every time I'm on my way to to go hang out with them. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. 
Maybe one day she'll feel like that about our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the next one she's on, she'll be talking about, about, about our podcast. Us. That's right. Well, and, and you know, and as a, I, I'm going to touch a little bit on this with a, as a Christian guy. And, you know, even the Bible teaches you that you got to take some time off. You got to have that seventh day of rest. You can think about whatever you want, but just enjoy that time. You don't feel like you have to be anywhere. You don't feel like you have to do anything. Think about whatever you want to think mm-hmm. about and just enjoy that to make a better you. And then once you do that, a recharge, you're a better person afterwards. And I think it's a lot from what I'm gathering from what you're saying that after you take that time and you have that white space, that you become a better right after that to do whatever else you have to do on your book of life. Right? I believe you do. I think the term I might get it wrong is Selah from the Bible, which means basically this open time, this unplanned time. But you see how even in your, even after I talked about the various applications of white space, your definition when you retold the story of that day was mostly about rest and recuperation. Mm-hmm. And so one of the messages we need to give people is it's a yes and. Yes, it is about I recover, I come back and I pour from a full cup, I take a disconnected vacation, I come back as a different person. That's all very important. But the other part of it is that you work all day in different businesses, nonprofits, military, and you have problems you're trying to solve and you're trying to solve them only from pounding on them as opposed to that oxygenation of stepping back, some mind wandering, letting it be a little bit more fluid in the way that you solve those problems. So it is also a business tool. It's always very important to say both of those in the same breath. I think that's wonderful because we, we even talked a little bit about stepping back from things, you know, if somebody does something to anger you, don't <laughs> respond right away. Mm, you know, kind of the yeah. same guideline. Let me take a little moment to refresh and think about that so I don't respond in a way that I shouldn't. You know, uh, and, and we call yeah. that a wedge. So a wedge is a little piece of white space inserted any place that you need to open up the tightness of your life. So it can be between a meeting and a meeting, between finishing a project, picking up the next. It can be between something difficult happening and you responding. Or one of my favorite, when you drive in the driveway at home, instead of just quickly getting out, just just a little wedge behind that wheel just before you come in and you want to be (sighs) a different person, right? So those wedges are very doable for people and they open and they oxygenate and they fight back against this misconception that that white space always has to be long to be valid, that if I can't take this executive 30 minutes, then why bother? That's the wedge fights back with that. I agree with that. See, I need Juliet in my life. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Because you know my lifestyle. She does. Oh, I can tell from your energy level. And all the things that I do on a, I mean, being a self-employed person, you know, from the acting and the radio and the production and the podcasting and the MC work and the volunteer work. And I mean, it is a, it doesn't stop. Oh, it's a nonstop thing. So I have found that my white space is early in the morning. I get up even earlier in the morning to, uh, to have a little bit of that time and a little devotionals and stuff like that. But I know if I've got an activity where I want to give myself whether it's golf, uh, I lead a men's group disc golf mm. on Mondays, that kind of thing. If I want to do these things, then I have to put the work somewhere else. So I get up earlier, do a little mm-hmm. bit of work. Maybe I might work a little bit later, but I'm intentional with giving myself that stuff that's going to give me like my just walking along. Hey, thank you, Lord. Or, hey, I'm going to spend some time with a good friend or whatever, or mm-hmm. even just alone time sitting by a, a, a lake and just, man, I love the shape of that tree. Whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, think about anything and everything that... Uh, so I can appreciate that as well. So when um, when you see that I don't answer a text or something, I'm going to just type back white space. White space. White I'm in, in my white space. You know space. what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. I so, had a, that same military leader who was so um, generous with the book listing said, sometimes in the military, it's just one breath. Yeah. The difference, you know, even in battle. And she, she mm-hmm. said this, I didn't say it, even in battle, that there sometimes there is just one breath is the difference. And I, I think huge. it can be as it can be down to that. So I want to uh, lead into this part here, the Eden project and what you're talking about, mm. uh, retired uh, military folks, veterans, uh, people who may have some issues going on, whether it's PTSD, uh, mm. kind of getting integrated back into life, or maybe it's something they've dealt with for a long time. I think a lot of these topics that we've talked about and the things that you've been sharing are closely related to them as well. Not just businesses, but also for the military as well, whether they're still active or again, like I said, veterans, because I think there's that constant thing going on in that mind where it's just bang, 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 go, go, go. go. Especially if they have, if they move into any kind of jobs in a corporate environment. I think I told you about there was a nonprofit that failed that tried to incorporate our work. Their idea was that 
corporate environments are too stressful for veterans was basically the summary of it. And if you could make corporate environments less stressful, you could attract more veterans or at least retain more veterans. And so they wanted to use our training programs to smartify the way that work gets done and make it a little bit less stressful. And they, they unfortunately didn't move forward, but it was my first glimpse into, oh, I wonder if there's a necessary sensitivity around that population in a different way. Yeah. Interesting that they thought they had to slow it down for us because typically it's not slow it down, just make it less crazy and stressful. Yeah. Was the was the and see and then remember there's a difference between that. Make it less stressful doesn't necessarily mean slow it down. So I mean, there's a way that we look at how terms and yeah. how everybody sees something in a different mm-hmm. way too. And it, you know, not to go down a, a, a rabbit hole, but I am. Hi. Um, the world I came from, I was in counterterrorism. I was in the infantry. I, I you know, we I did some things that was. I would have appreciated slowing or, or someplace that was less stress because mm-hmm. that the world that I lived in was, was high stress, mm-hmm. high tempo, mm-hmm. constant. So maybe it depends on the military, the type of military mm-hmm. they came from going into corporate or, or what type of corporate they were going into. I think this fits everywhere. Mm. Um, I think what you're oh, doing yeah. Yeah. fits profit, nonprofit, um, veteran, uh, law enforcement. I can see this being used Um, We're doing some pilots with the the police now and we're seeing all these. I mean, I honestly, uh, a couple years ago, never in a million years would have seen military and police as areas where this work fit. But it it seems to be uh, very appreciated. We just say everybody's too busy. And if you're too busy, you could use a manual on how to become less busy. I love it. Basically. You, should, you can be their manual. So um, the Eden Project, Brent, uh, does uh, something with the Gratitude Journal. Yeah. And I know that you wanted to kind of maybe just, mm. is, is, there, is there a way we can tie these in together? I think so. So, you know, initially I'm, I'm thinking I, I didn't understand the difference un, until we had this conversation. So we can maybe add this as a, an, an additional... I won't say a weapon, an initial tool, tool, tool <laughs> in the toolbox. Tool is better we, in this we, context. Um, one, of the, one of the founding cornerstone practices that, that we offer is our gratitude journey. Love it. So we have people start out. I, I say start out the day because it really sets your mind on the right track, mm-hmm. focusing on, on what you're grateful for. I do the same thing. You kind of mentioned it early just a little bit that, you know, if, if you let your mind wander, typically it'll wander to, to some negative stuff. That's natural. Yeah. 80% of our thoughts are negative. So we, knowing that, we, we help people or we train people to write down things that they're grateful mm. for. It doesn't take that long. No, it's such so a good practice. Gratitude journal, <clears throat> excuse me, is one of the, the main things we do. But we do mindfulness. Um, mm-hmm. And there was a third one that I'm, I'm of course, now that I'm, I'm going Statins. Blank. It's statins. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but I definitely want to include this and in, in get, get to know this better because I think white space is a, a powerful tool yeah. once people understand how to do it, and it's okay right. to, to So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a, a person who's being proactive about their well-being, and they begin to j- gratitude journal in the mornings. That's a thing that they do. They bring a more positive lens to their life. It's a beautiful thing. Then they begin to meditate, and it starts to calm down their nervous system, and they feel better during the day, and that's a beautiful thing. But let's say this person also doesn't know what they want to do in their future, or maybe they're retiring and they don't see their plan clearly, or maybe they're in a marriage they don't know if they want to stay in, or a million other things. Neither gratitude journaling or meditation creates a container to think about your life, to really just right, think about right. what do you want and where are you going and what is this chapter about and what kind of spouse am I and are my dreams working out and all that stuff we never have time to think about unless we have white space, because we will just move to the next activity. And even though they are very good activities, Mm -hmm. exercise and gratitude journaling and meditation for me in my morning can often just be my checklist. And I am going through them and I'm getting the visceral and biological benefits of them. But I still may, I could go weeks without thinking about my life or my marriage or my children or my dreams. And that's what the white space is for. I love it. I love that too. Juliet, if somebody right now wanted to look you up, I mean, aside from, you know, beauty magazines and things like that. Um, <laughs> Hopefully you don't have video. Uh, JulietFunt.com is easy. It's just my name. Oh, okay. Well, that's easy because I know you had a website here about videos. and. Uh, oh, that was for you. Oh, that was for, oh, I'll, yeah. I'll look at that later. Um, <laughs> JulietFunt.com. He's fast, man. Dot com. Juliet, J-U-L-I-E-T-F-U-N-T.com.
Okay, so that's how that's how like we Romeo and Juliet. And we'll also when we post this, will that will include that so people when they can click on maybe a link and and see that wherever they like to get their yeah. podcast and things like that. Love it. Um, man, what a what a what a treat to have you here because you know you're so you're busy and popular and 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 wanted in a lot of different places and you took a little time to be with us here at uh, Rome at Trillith which is where we're coming from today once again our podcast coming from Rome at Trillith uh, right next to Fayetteville Georgia this is where uh, a lot of new dreams are coming true for the up and coming actors and and the businesses that are opening up around here um, and so we're grateful to be part of this in our in our podcast studio here today. Yeah. Was there anything that we did? I mean, the, the, we could go into, into like another hour or two hours. No. Of just fast. But we can't. I'll tell you about. my favorite tool that nobody gets enough that doesn't get enough airtime because I love to throw this in. My favorite tool that hasn't become that hasn't tipped enough is called phone narration. I think that this is a life saving tool when you are with your family and you're doing something on your phone. Narrate what you're doing. Because, so they know what you're doing. Oh, I'm just checking one email from my boss. Oh, I'm just looking up the map to grandma's house because otherwise we spend so much time with our loved ones where we just disappear into the yeah. screen and they have no idea what we're doing and when we'll be back. Watching and if videos. they even notice that they went, if you even notice that you went into the phone. So when in our home and in the people that are close fans of our work, we narrate, I hear stories about narrations. My kids will say, could you please narrate? My kids will narrate. I'm oh, just looking up to wow. see what time the bowling party is starting. It is a family changing, game changing tool. So play with it and then write me at JulietFunt.com and I, tell me how it went. I love that because like my son, he'll say, yeah, let's spend some time. Come on. He'll come over and we're like watching something and I'll look over and all of a sudden like he's on his phone and I can see you. I can see what he's doing on there. He's just looking at videos and yeah. stuff and scrolling yeah. and I'm yeah. like, well, that's, that's the other benefit of narration is you have to say it. So then if you're doing something mindless, what you're going to say um, on TikTok while we're supposed to be having bonding time, you nice. have to say it out loud. I like that. So. Stop, Stop it. <laughs> Stop doing we'll, it. We'll have you back. Sometime, Great, sure. And then we'll talk about if if, if we've practiced the the. Oh the phone yes, there. try it, try it, try I'm it. Definitely, gonna do it. And we, we would love to have you back too, because you know, not everybody comes here as just a one time only guest. Yeah. Great, yeah. done. So we would glad. So thank you so much, Juliet Font, for being here today and sharing with us. And uh, again, we will have contact information for for you and how people can look you up. And uh, and of course, people will now be rushing to go say. I haven't watched Candid Camera in forever. Yeah, right? I do that. <laughs> Will they find any? Did you have any ones over you as a child, as a baby, like ever uh, make it to an at episode? At five, if you, it might be on there. You Google uh, Julie. I don't know what you'd Google. Juliet Funt uh, interviewed by dad, maybe, oh, maybe. Neat. So we can go back and look at her yeah. five years old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow, how you've changed. <laughs> Well, Bren, thank you so much for another lovely episode yeah, and, it was and doing what you do to put these together to make them. Um, beneficial for those who are listening and if you are listening whether it's your first time or uh, or maybe you've just been a regular and, and you're, yeah really and you've lo- is this our eighth one yeah i've lost count already it's a uh we started just this year uh you can find out more about us eden-project.com that's eden e-d-e-n dash project.com or call or text 678-632-5383 if there's something that's going on in your veteran life that yeah. you know you might need some advice or some help or just want to ask a question uh 678 678- 7-8-6-3-2-5-3-8-3. Anything else you want to add? I think that's it. You covered it. Um, thank you so much. It was much great. No, today. thank you. That was really fun. Yeah. And for the rest of you, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to having you back again soon to the After Action Report from the Eden Project.